And uh, we're going to start off a little bit slow. Mr. Reyes is joining us. Uh, Mr. Weston will not be joining us, I'm told by staff. I really wish, as you look at the agenda, we were in the front of the whole city council. Could each of you play a valuable role in the humanities of the city, whether it's the parks, the art programs, the libraries, or our senior programs. That being said, what we do today, uh, when they come to council, I may want to consolidate some of this so that we could get your voice out so all council members know of the work and the challenges that you do. Let's start with number one. Item number one is a budget motion, Labange Han, relative to the Department of Recreation and Parks maintaining the policy that facilities will always be opened as per existing ordinances, allotted funding and use data. Good morning, Good morning. Regina Adams, Executive Officer of Recreation and Parks. Um, first of all, we'd like to be able to uh, come back to this committee with a more detailed written report, but right now I can just tell you overall this is going to be very difficult for us to be able to um, meet what's required here. One of the reasons is, of course, financial. And the other is because we have less resources, less staff to be able to provide the services that we have. Um, the CAO yesterday presented a report in Budget and Finance Committee, which was showing the adjusted budget is, budgets for the departments due to the furlough um, phase that was cut out of the department budget versus the coalition agreements and other um, labor negotiations. In that report, it showed for recreation and parks that at this point in time, they believe that we were about $1.9 million short. Um, for us, it's actually a, more over $4 million because there were some things that were not included in that report. As I stated to um, this committee and also to the full council, we will have to see what will happen post-summer with our department and what services and programs will be able to continue and at what level and what capacity. What would be helpful, I think, to my colleagues would be some written report that says what your transformation has been since 2001 to 2011, okay. and then and and show that from a graph point. Uh, also, the population, which has increased, parks have become more popular. There's more stay vacations. There's more people trying to get some joy uh, out of life in their city facilities as opposed to going to a state park. State parks are closed. Uh, in addition, uh, whatever the CAO could add to that. And then uh, the other thing, too, Regina, and I don't know if this is specific to this issue here, there are 10 parks that have been highlighted as parks that are – and have you got to explain that to the council and what you expect them to do? We'll, we'll be able to do that as well. And this is a rough question because I don't like the fact that we have to – I want to be a fine city, not a fine city, and I like to be a free city, not a fee city, but there's realities. Take, for instance, Pan Pacific Park. If there's no programming in the park, could you get revenue from parking for the businesses on Beverly uh, post 7 o'clock at night and, uh, and charge for parking or, or have a, a lease agreement with some people who have approached us on that parking issue? That's one thing. I don't like it, but just if you could look at that. Uh, I went to Venice Beach on Sunday, and I parked at LA Unified. Uh, for $12 on a school parking lot, not a school playground. And I thought, okay, there's some revenue that is, you know, sitting there. But at the same time, it's very difficult in the metropolitan area to do anything with the LA Unified. Uh, but at Venice, they appear to find a way to get some revenue. I hope that stays at the Venice School, but it probably goes to the general fund. So uh, Mr. Reyes is fine. Deputy is here today representing uh, them. Uh, in the first district, so uh, I note that Mr. Reyes uh, will not be able to attend, but we uh, know he'll we'll talk to him later on. So we'll get this report back. Yes. What it's uh, near the mid of, of July now. What's operable for you? Not convenient, but operable. Thirty days. Thirty days would be great. Okay. And then also, if you could highlight too, because I know your general manager told me he's, if I could use this term, front-loading activities for the summers. The camps will be open as usual, summer night lights, all the commitments that he has made. But then what happens in the off season? And the other thing to note, LA Unified is rapidly transforming. I think there's only two high schools that are year round uh, left, and they're both out of the city, but they're still in the Unified Huntington Park and 
I think Southgate or some uh, school, what impact that has on you because if there's no place to play, if they're not in school, are they at the parks? If they're not at the parks, they're in the streets. What's the deal? So if you could aspect that. The schedule change, you mean this coming up for next uh, Yeah, year? what impact it has. Right. So that's on item one. So we'll back in 30 days. We'll try to do that before recess in council. So it may be even less than 30 days if it's possible because we want to get this in maybe before the recess. So we okay. can look at that. Next item, please. Uh, council member, for the record, are we uh, continuing or approving? We'll continue this? it, yeah, 30 days. Okay. Item number two is a adopted budget recommendation relative to reports from the city administrative officer and the Department of Recreation and Parks on a strategy for public-private partnerships. Once again, Regina Adams, Executive Officer, Recreation and Parks, and also with me I have Vicki Israel, our Assistant General Manager over our partnership branch. Vicki will be able to provide information on this item. Good morning, Councilman. Good morning, Ms. Israel. Good morning, City Attorney. Um, the department, as you know, has restructured, and in doing so, the de partnership division has been formed to actually build relationships between the park facilities and the department with nonprofit and for-profit organizations to enhance city resources and maximize the delivery of services, including programming opportunities and to optimize facility utilization. The department so far in the division has um, <clears throat> worked up and created documentation, procedures, and reporting forms on the structure and guidance. We've also created training materials and have gone out to the field staff, maintenance, as well as recreation field, and have provided training to them so that they understand what the partnership is all about. The division also to recommend and refer folks that they come in contact with. We've evaluated over 200 existing partners, and we have created marketing materials, brochure, web page, uh, handbook, annual performance reviews, so that we can go out and actually monitor and review our partners. Um, we've also created weekly and monthly st uh, statistical reports so that we can track the information about the organizations. We have come up with a brochure that provides the benefits of being a partner and also um, to make sure that when we uh, do our outreach and marketing out to the communities and to the, within the city and without the city, whether it's private corporations or nonprofit corporations, is so that they are aware of the benefits of partnering with the department. One is collaboration, of course, because we are a renowned leader in the recreation field. Um, we're a full-service recreation agency with highly trained professional staff. Um, also, we can increase program awareness, increase diversity across the city within a partner, and that we also, on an individual basis, um, kind of hear and personalize their agreements and needs with us. So, the other thing that we have been doing, um, and which is a focus on some revenue generating to assist the department, is to try to recoup and shift some payments for utilities and for um, waste removal. And we have um, created... Now, prior to this period of economic challenges, sanitation would pick up your trash, trash and not charge you. Correct, correct. The city paid for And how are they charging you? Or did the city pay for it? The city would pay for it through the city's general fund. It affected July 1st of this year. Recreation Parks now has to pay its own uh, trash. Right. Do, you, do they project what's your trash? About $3.7 million. And much of your trash is recyclable trash, though. Is yes. it? Is it? I don't know if you're technical on trash, but you know what a MRF is? No. Where it takes all trash and it is able to separate it. There's a location in uh, Long Beach near the harbor. There's other locations. Because if I don't want to say I go through your trash, but I'm in the parks every day and I go through your trash and I dump a trash can in Dante's view and I look at the trash and much of it is recyclable. I mean, it's not uh, hardcore garbage that you would find in a house. And, uh, Madam CLA, I'd like to work with sanitation on this to see what they could do. And also what uh, in, the, in the past, this is in the past, the parks have been a a place where, whether it's Bishop's Canyon and uh, Elysian Park, Toyon Canyon, and Griffith Park, other locations, have used as landfills. 
did recreation and parks get uh, a uh, tipping fee for any of that? Do we know? We already work with uh, sanitation on a lot of it for the recyclables and also for our green waste. And so no, but forth. but so. in in from 58 to 85 in Toyon Canyon and from whatever it was, did you know? And you may have to historically check. Did you get a tipping fee? Which means every time a truck comes, you get a. Do you know if you did? And I, I don't know. We do. Yeah. You did? Yes. Every yes, truck came, you got. I had to check and see if it's every truck, but I believe we do get. Yes, there are tipping fees. Yes. Okay, because I think that's a little bit of an argument that we could look at. Um, and some other things too. I, I often, I do believe in the transfer from water power. Water power doesn't pay taxes. Water power is putting a, a water line for all the city's good through probably a, not a pre-existing, but a, a hundred year old line through uh, Griffith Park. Uh, they're not paying you anything as a franchise free as a gas company would pay. But uh, we should look at some of those utility easements as far as, you know, if there's anything that could be recovered, even though I'd like to study it myself, because I think a lot of this becomes a bureaucratic cost and not a real cost. Prior to the energy crisis that this state was in, uh, if DWP was shutting down number three at uh, Valley Generation, they'd call uh, their colleague up at Morro Bay at PG&E and ask them for 500 megawatts for the next three weeks and they'd put it in pencil and they'd send them 500, they'd send it back and there was never a problem. Now because we're struggling to get every dime, uh, it becomes a game of struggle as opposed to a game of service and government should be a business of service. Mr. Scholl, join the table there. From Good morning, Mike Scholl with Recreation and Parks. Um, regarding some of the, the, the trash bill and, and, and our relationship with sanitation, which is a good, very good relationship. Sanitation is a great bureau. But the, um, one of the things that um, we thought was worth pursuing is the fact that we at Rec and Parks allow sanitation under Proposition O to use a great deal of our land for, for no value whatsoever in, in order to put, um, you know, the, the um, the types of projects that they're doing under Prop O inside the park system, whereas otherwise they would have had to have acquired property to do so. So there is a value to that, and it's you know, it's something that we're not um, not currently getting that would certainly more than offset you know the cost of the trash that we're paying. It's there's you know there is some disparity there. Right. So I think we should figure that out and then try to attack it. You know. Uh, also, the other question too, I've heard. Uh, uh, and I've felt it personally, but I've heard, you know, in public-private partnerships, we talked this about uh, cultural affairs, and there was a lot of uh, hostility. Uh, people don't understand or don't like or think that they pay their taxes they should be. Uh, I'm thinking, in, uh, Madam City Attorney, that they should be coined as uh, public community projects, and the word private uh, possibly be eliminated uh, they are what they are. If a, if a corporation wants to do it, they'll step up and do it. But it scares people, the word private. And I think it may be worthy of us to change that vernacular, if that's correct. But I will let other minds think of that. And because uh, we are, there's a, not on this agenda, I don't believe, is the zoo. But the zoo is looking for a, a community partner to operate. And we're not trying to make it a private zoo. It's still a public zoo, but there's a community partner. So I think to relieve the fear that it becomes private, because people would hate to see a private park, but uh, they would love to see a community partner. Uh, okay. Something to think about. Kick it around in your next staff meeting. Vicki, how many people in your division? Uh, eight. Eight. That's a big task. Okay. So on item number two, uh, you're going to give us a little bit of a re written report, and we'll try to combine all these when you come to council, and maybe if, if the commission president and the general manager are available to make presentations with you. When we do this, you know, we'll have a good, robust discussion about where the parks are this year and where they're going. Uh, the next item, then that's, we're going to continue that to the, to the, what's the first meeting in August? The, <coughs> pardon me, the first meeting in August is August 9th. Right, which we're not going to be there. And then the second meeting is? The second meeting is August the 23rd, but that is uh, council yeah, recess. We may have a special meeting if we feel, but we'll just, we'll just talk it out, talk with the CAO, 
see if our timing is right, or we may take it in September. Got it. But let's continue this matter. It won't be before, it will not be before the 9th. Next is item 3. Item number three is an adopted budget recommendation relative to a report from the Department of Recreation and Parks on golf facility management. Again, Regina Adams, Executive Officer, Recreation and Parks. Um, this item for our golf division um, last fiscal year was the first year that our golf division was taken totally offline from the city budget. We have approximately 400 employees involved in our golf division, which are full and part-time employees and they are totally responsible for covering 100% of the cost for, for their jobs and the services they provide to the residents. The city general fund is no longer subsidized in, the, subsidizing this division in any way, shape, or form. Along with that, we've been directed by both um, our board, the mayor, and the council. We are also currently doing an analysis of the golf division to determine the future of where this uh, division should go whether or not it should continue as being operated by the department or if it should be contracted out or some combination thereof. We currently have a consultant who is looking at this and um, going to present a report to us within the next few weeks, and we will do our analysis of that and we'll be presenting a report to our board. This will involve um, the operations for our golf, and also as of this uh, January 1st, we also took on um, operating the electric golf carts ourselves. We just um, last week um, had 500 new electric golf carts delivered to our various golf locations. And we also are, this month, we're going to be running a, a special for the golfers so that they can also get a discount when they rent um, the golf carts along with paying their green fees. So we're going to have a two-week uh, plan for that, a promotional plan for that to have them come back. We, uh, we had a period of time where we had a little difficulty with acquiring the new golf carts, and we worked with the city attorney in his office, and we thanked them very much, and we were able to get this resolved, and we were just able to get these new golf carts, and we are hearing wonderful praises from the golfers. Um, they're enjoying them, and so we're going to run this promotion for them for two weeks so that they can come back and, and try them out. Well, how many, uh, you got 500 golf carts? 500 new. Where were they manufactured, you know? Club cart. And they were, uh, came from Atlanta. Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And they come over a train or a truck? Truck. So, it was uh, quite an operation to see yeah. because, yeah, they, they, you know, the trucks came in, and, of course, we had to time it at different golf courses and so forth. And they bring them in, and also as, with the assistance of our staff and uh, the club car, they assemble them um, at the location, and they also they are charged. And we roll out in the, the old golf carts, and we roll out the new golf carts. Right. How many carts on each truck, do you think? I, <laughs> why would you ask me that? Yeah, I, I'm <laughs> one of, 20, 20, 28. 28. Yeah. Yeah. So 28 divided into she 500 is. What's 28 divided into 500, Lisa? <laughs> okay. I just want to know how many trucks came from Atlanta. Just that. <laughs> Come on, Lisa. The clock's on. You're not going to win the prize. But anyway, I think that's important. I think our challenge is if we do any uh, integrated. Uh, management system there is within a number of parks there's dominant space that would then be integrated with a private operator and a public park and how that works I know county does it at Brookside but many of their their parks are total I'm not totally familiar with all county facilities but they're when I envision Brookside although there's picnic areas around the Rose Bowl the dominant landmass that the private operator has is defined quite queerly. There's no, you know, grass stops here and the grass starts there, one or the other. But you get that number, Lisa? 17. 17 trucks? That's not bad. Okay. All righty. Okay. Thank you. So we'll get a written report on that as we compile this all together. Next one. Item number four is an adopted budget recommendation relative to a report from the Department of Recreation and Parks on fees for the use of facilities by sports teams. Virginia Adams, Executive Officer of Recreation and Parks. Uh, on this item here, I would have to get back on a written report. I'm not sure exactly what uh, information is required here, what you're looking for. Well, what is, uh, like, how do we compare? I know I've read in the daily news sometimes they have stories about big sporting events where uh, a, what was the municipal league or adult leagues play and they come to Lancaster and they go into hotels and they have uh, softball tournaments or things of this nature here. Uh, we do have a municipal sports program. Yes. 
Uh, we do have soccer mm -hmm. leagues that play here. You've corrected all the uh, unethical lease to me and I lease to somebody else. Yes, we've been working all those items where we found. Is that pretty well cleaned up? Uh, yes, the majority of it is. Uh -huh. yeah, we've been working very hard on that. But I think I would look at that on the sports teams and how it is and what uh, also what is your joint use between LA Unified and uh, on issues of sports teams. Okay. You know, you let them use the gym and, and they use the park or right. vice versa. Okay. Swimming pools and things of that nature. Okay, thank you. So you report back. And again, we're going to combine all these two in one, one probably action in council for you to report. Okay. And I will prep the council on this, like a state of the uh, Recreation and Parks Department 2011. Uh, number five, please. Item number five is an adopted budget recommendation relative to a report from the Department of Recreation and Parks on the application and use of Quimby fees. Virginia, thank you for Recreation and Parks, and also with me have Daryl Ford from our planning division who can also uh, provide information on this report. Daryl Ford from Recreation and Parks. Um, uh, during the budget deliberations, the department prepared a report back for the Budget and Finance Committee, which uh, briefly went through some of the major issues vis-a-vis um, -vis the city's Quimby program, talked a little bit about the background of the program, and um, uh, made a, a series of, essentially identified a series of things that the department staff and city planning staff had identified issues that should be um, looked at going forward in the future. So, um, What are some of those issues? Uh, one of the major issues with the city's Quimby program that needs to be looked at between staff and city planning and recreation parks is the structure of the fees that are paid, the in lieu fees that are paid by developments. Uh, one of the other major issues needs to be looked at are the types of developments that pay Quimby fees because not all residential developments actually pay fees. So um, it, it hits disproportionately on um, subdivisions and certain types of zone change projects. So not every residential project will pay a fee. and Obviously, if the purpose of paying the fee is to help build more parkland, one of the things we want to look at is making sure that all residential developments pay that fee so that, that the fees will be distributed more evenly across the city. And what is happening across the state and other recreation agencies on Quimby? Have you been uh, familiar with anything? Is other counties doing things that we should be enlightened to? We, we looked at the issue in response to several council motions a couple of years ago. We would like to go back, though, and, and sort of revisit some of that research. Uh, one of the things that we did discover was that the way that the city approaches uh, collection of Quimby fees and, and the allocation of those is a little bit different than how the state law reads and a little bit different than some of our uh, fellow cities and counties do it. So we would like to discuss with some of our other colleagues across the cities and, and across the state about how they do this. If you would, in your national or statewide organization, then make sure the city attorney's briefed on that so whatever we do is legal. And then also, I have no problem, and it is just the way it is, where if Quimby fees are generated, Quimby fees stays. That is not being challenged, is it? No, and that's actually one thing we were just talking about was the radius and, and right. state law um, um, talks about reasonable distance and the city has a, a little bit of a firmer policy of a one to two mile radius that we use those fees. So that is something that differs among uh, cities and counties across the state. Right. And the other thing I would just say, if let's say you had to do something, but it was within a, 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 a gray area, meaning only gray because that's the term, uh, that there should be some appealable way to be able to do. Let's say you had a choice of taking out a lot of housing or being able to build a park three blocks out of the prescribed area, that you would allow it to be built three blocks out of the prescribed area if it saved the housing or some of these things that box you in. Uh, so work with your department, and when this comes back, it, it's, it's uh, very important, but not as important. It's as important as everything, but it's not the core that we're looking at in the first uh, four items, but you'll probably be asked to report on that. Yeah, on this particular item, um, we would need a lot more time than, than whatever the next meeting right. would have us come back on. Yeah, so why don't we do a 90-day? A, a, a you want a thorough look at that and work with uh, your statewide recreation. What other states are doing, other counties and cities? Okay, thank you. And where we would be without Quimby, you know, that's a sure good thing. Next. Item number six is an adopted budget recommendation relative to reports from the city administrative officer and the Department of Recreation and Parks regarding Venice Beach 
and the feasibility and cost and impacts of the city maintaining the beach and operating the parking lots and transitioning Venice Beach into a standalone unit? Again, Regina Adams, Executive Officer, and also with me have Kevin Regan, our Assistant General Manager over our Operational Branch, and Kevin can report on this item. Good morning, Councilman. How are you doing? Um, with this item, there is a, a, a desire, um, I believe, by Council Member Rosendahl to study the feasibility of the Department of Recreation and Parks taking back some of the pay parking lots which are actually uh, under the ownership of the Department of Recreation and Parks but on long-term lease to the county. Um, the county is allowed to operate those parking lots in and around Venice Beach and also to collect the revenue. Uh, we'd be happy to report back on this item to you. Um, I know the council office has done some preliminary study of the issue. I would just uh, let you know that there is kind of a, a quid pro quo that occurs with the beach, and that is that the county does the lifeguarding and the maintenance on the actual beach. Um, the city doesn't does not have that obligation. Um, we would have to make sure that there was a good, uh, a, a good solid cost benefit analysis, and that the revenue from the parking lots would cover that maintenance on the beach. Because surely, if we were to force the county into giving those parking lots back to the city and then the city taking that revenue, the county would give up the maintenance and the lifeguarding operations on the beach and we would have to be responsible for that. So it's just something to think about. Well, if I believe my history was after Prop 13 where not just Los Angeles but other municipalities along the coast consolidated all lifeguards into the county. That's true, but those were done with a um, lease, lease type of agreements and those right. agreements are can be terminated by either party with giving proper notice and I know the county's strapped and they're having a tough time on the beaches as well. I understand that. So just all you think, do you think Kevin Reagan, a recreation administrator, 30 year veteran plus, that Venice Beach should be a standalone department like El Pueblo? Uh, well, I think that's something that we would need to look at. I think there's a... I, know, I don't ask what we need to look at. I want to know what you think. Yeah, this is like Washington where the Congress asks you a, a tough question and then you scratch your head <laughs> and then CNN gets I'm, the picture, you're scratching your head. <laughs> uh, Regina Adams. <laughs> <laughs> I was saying... I would, <laughs> I would. Kevin's more diplomatic than I am. Right. <laughs> My response is this. As if Venice Beach were able to cover itself financially, where it would stand alone and 100 percent cover its cost, then that might be a viable option. If it's not able to do that, and also it costs us and the city more um, revenue and uh, more expenses and so forth, then no, I do not believe that that would be yeah, the way to go. I just don't know if we're parceling off. In a way, sometimes it, it was economic challenges and other issues that took the zoo away from the Parks Department, El Pueblo away from the Parks Department. All of a sudden, you'll have a bunch of mini departments when the mission uh, can't be done. And also, we have to cooperate in, with the county and consistency with lifeguard safety. But that's good. you're a good diplomat there. OK, Kevin, thank you very much. So we're going to just continue this here. Uh, and you study this. And we'll do 90 days on this, because you get the whole summer. We'll back it up with uh, the previous issue, which is the Quimby funds. Okay. Well, this completes Recreation of Parks. Thank Recreation of Parks. We'll all go out to the parks and enjoy. Thank you very much. Next item. Item number seven is an adopted budget recommendation relative to a report from the library department on the status of its volunteer program. Good morning. Yes. Chris Marita, AGM with the library department, and I have with me Cheryl Collins, uh, acting director of Branch Library Services. Hi. Good morning. Um, regarding our volunteer program, currently the library has about 7,000 active volunteers. Last year they provided about 145,000 hours of service. Among those 7,000 volunteers, we have 1,000 volunteers in the adult literacy program teaching adults how to read, 300 adult uh, volunteers in our grandparents and books program teaching uh, read, um, children how to strengthen their reading skills. 75 volunteer docents conducting tours of the Central Library, 150 volunteers delivering books to homebound residents, and about 5,200 volunteers that are members of our Friends of the Library groups that raise funds and assist us with library programs. 
Our volunteer programs do not use volunteers to replace paid staff. Our regular employees perform the core services and the volunteers are used only to enhance the core services. We want to expand our volunteer program. Our goals for expansion include establishing a new infrastructure. We want to hire a full-time volunteer coordinator and possibly other staff. Let me ask you a question. Could the Library Foundation provide the money to hire the volunteer coordinator so you're not using They've been trying funds? to help us. Um, and we've, in this whole last year, we've been trying to secure private funds, so we have been unsuccessful in doing that. So we're going to Plan B. And Plan B, uh, we're in the middle of a, re a large reorganization, and Plan B is to hire from within. Right. So we're... Now, you're a librarian. Mm -hmm. In our country, who's the most notable volunteer? You know, like you could say Smokey Bear is the most notable fire prevention person, and he's a bear. But uh, uh, th we should identify that. And I, do you have, of the course of a year, do you have the library department salutes our volunteer day or? We do have recognition programs. Recognition programs. And yeah. So in this expansion, we want to strengthen our re uh, recognition and retention programs. And that's what we're looking to as part of our. Uh, count on me to help you. And this is a very good thing that you have done and continue to do. I do think the Library Foundation, this is an ideal candidate to fund. Right. And I'll talk to the Library Foundation as well, because that would be a great chair, mm -hmm. you know, like right. they have at universities where they have the Annenberg chair or something right. of this nature here. But Just since they haven't, or we haven't right. been able to, so we're going to hire from within. So hopefully and by the end of August, we'll... Uh, hire a person from promote a person within the ranks to be a principal right. librarian in charge of volunteer services and strategic partnerships and we hope this person will you know will be full-time dedicated to building our volunteer program working with our friends groups working with community groups uh, corporations to increase our volunteers so we hope in a year that uh, we've increased our volunteer uh, our number of volunteers by at least 10 to 15 percent We've increased our retention rate by uh, 15 to 20 percent. So we have a lot of goals for a year from now. Okay. Well, this is important. We should have an annual report on volunteers. Sure. I know the Parks Department gets a whole bunch of volunteers. Lisa, note uh, volunteer programs for all departments in the next meeting for Record Parks. Allow me to work with you, whatever I can do to help. Great. That would be great. Thank you, Chris. Okay. And then you got one more item. Right. We're going to... Uh, what do, what do you want to do with this, Chris? Do you want to, uh, do you need any more time to uh, study it, or do you want to report to the council? We can go to full council, or I think yeah, good. next to budget and finance, and then yeah. we'll go to full council. Have you, have you gone to budget and finance? No. So you go to budget and finance. Okay. Got it. Thank, Thank you. you. Next item. Okay. Uh, First is the budget and finance, and then the council. Yes. Okay. Yep. okay. We'll note and file this item and send it forward. Super, Richard. Okay. Uh, item number eight is an adopted budget recommendation relative to a report from the library department on the status of restoring library hours and services. Uh, thanks to the city council and the leaders of the city council, including uh, council member Tom LeBonge, the mayor, library supporters, the unions, and especially the Los Angeles voters. Um, they voted for Measure L, the public library charter amendment, which was approved on March 8, 2011. So this new amendment will provide the library funding, library funds over a four-year period to gradually restore library services to 2009-2010 levels. So the plan to restore library services over four years is as follows. In 2011-12, we're going to restore six-day service, restore Mondays at all 73 libraries. In uh, 2012-13, we're going to restore two evenings a week. Right now, we're only open two evenings. We want to go back to four evenings a week in 2012-13. In 2013-14, we want to increase funding for library materials and technology upgrades. And in 2014-15, we want to restore seven-day library service at the Central Library and the eight regional libraries. So Very that's good. our four-year plan. So for 2011-12, Measure L provided $13 million to the library's budget, and of that amount, per the, ch the new charter amendment, 55% uh, or $7 million goes to related costs, and 45% or $6 million goes to the direct costs for our, for our operations. 
Of that $6 million for direct costs, $4.3 million is used for the costs associated with existing employees, leaving $1.7 million to restore six-day service. So library management and the unions continue to participate in impact bargaining discussions regarding the restoration of six-day service. The new coalition agreements may provide the library more funds, and we're waiting for the numbers from the CEO's office. In the meantime, we've developed a plan to restore six-day service with a small amount of $1.7 million. The plan includes hiring part-time, as needed, at-will employees to provide six-day service as soon as possible. So we're happy to announce that on Monday, July 18th, we're restoring Monday service or six-day week service at all 73 libraries this Monday. So we'll be having a press conference on Monday at 930 at the Central Library to celebrate this achievement. So we hope the council members will join us on Monday. I'll announce this in council. It's great work, Chris, the whole staff, and I'll see you there on Monday. Thank you. On this issue here, this is good. So we're going to note and file it and set it on the budget of finance as we move forward. Okay, great. Thank you. Have a great day. Item number nine is an adopted budget recommendation relative to a report from the Department of Disability with a plan and program to further utilize private sector groups and philanthropic organizations which work with the department and the disabled community. Is anyone here for the Office and Department of Disability? So on this issue here, we're going to instruct the Disability Department with a plan and program to further utilize private sector groups, community groups, philanthropic organizations to work with the department and the community. During the hearings that were held, the Budget and Finance Committee discussed the department and the idea of a public-private partnership with the public community, in my mind, and donors to enhance programs for individuals throughout the city. We're going to send this forth because we don't want to hesitate, but I did see Laura Trejo yesterday, so I don't know what conflicted with the meeting, but this is a standard request that we'll push for, send it forth to Budget and Finance. Next item. Item number 10 is an adopted budget recommendation relative to a report from the Department of Cultural Affairs on its arts education grants. Hello. Good morning. I'm Olga Garay, Executive Director of the Department of Cultural Affairs. Good morning. We would like a little bit of clarification as to what exactly you are envisioning for this report. We make grants to local organizations and individual artists, as you know. About 38 percent of the grants that we make annually have an arts education component, so we can absolutely list those and give you that information. But we also receive some grants from the National Endowment for the Arts, from the State Arts Council, et cetera, that have education, arts education. Okay, you see this right here? Yeah, you want the whole thing. This is the circle, and that's the city allocation. And what you do is you do like they do in these graphs that show where the money goes, you know, local artists, youth artists, seniors, or whatever. Then you have another one that covers the state grants and another one that covers the federal grants. And I think that would be helpful to have that in a very – and how to apply and how to get a grant, because the art communities – and any suggestions that one would have to enhance the opportunity for those who are seeking grants for the arts. So if you could come back in 30 days or our next meeting, which may be less, with some concept. Sure. You got the concept? Absolutely. Just a graph. And how it's done and what we've done. And also, as I asked Recreation and Parks, which may have been just a minute before you came, that they would go back to 2000, you know, a 10-year period. So to show the decrease in the challenge that we have and our ability to do what we have done in the past. So you look it over. We have a lot of that information. I don't think it goes back 10 years. It might go back. But you're for the art department. So be artistic and create an artistic graph. Okay. That simply states what it's about. Okay. Good. All right. And then we're going to continue that to the next meeting. Next item. 
Item number 11 is an adopted budget recommendation relative to reports from the City Administrative Officer and the Department of Cultural Affairs on the feasibility and impact of raising the arts development fee. We're not sure who proposed that. Um, this is something that is not being promoted by the department. The arts development fee has a very um, onerous uh, set of regulations that surround how that money is spent. Um, and we've actually been working since I've been here with the city attorney's office and with several of the council members to try. One percent for the art? This is the private side of the one percent yeah. for the art. And as you know, because we've discussed it, um, there are very strict regulations, um, things like the geographic nexus of where the money can be spent. We haven't been able to get an exact um, uh, length of um, where the where the activities have to take place from the city attorney's office, but generally speaking, it has to be either on the site that generated the money right. or very close by one or two blocks. What we'll do here is we'll continue this, but go for the top uh, 10 cities in the United States, mm -hmm. what they do, compare if anyone has any better ideas, what Chicago is very good art town, what they do. Also, make sure that Seattle... Uh, Portland, San Francisco, and San Diego, San Jose are included as far as a coastal uh, connection and then be able to come back to this committee with what others are. This would, uh, and also check with the AIA, the American Institute of Architects, what they would think, you know, because as architects, if they know there's a component in a project that calls for art, yeah, they've been actually very good partners to us, the AALA, right. and they were actually shocked when we told them just how restrictive the use of these monies were. I think that there's a lot of misinformation out in the community as we'll to how We'll see if these other cities have a, a, a more focused approach, and then we'll discuss it again. Okay. Super. So we'll continue that, and we'll go uh, 90 days, I think, because it give you Similar to the so Quimby and some more to do thorough research. Okay. Okay. Next item. Item number 12 is an adopted budget recommendation relative to a report from the Department of Cultural Affairs on a multifaceted funding policy for funding mm -hmm. facilities and grants. Mm -hmm. Yes, basically what this item is about is that um, in discussions with Council Member Zine, he was asking um, what if we should um, dedicate the bulk of the of the department's money to the facilities that we manage, and um, just as you have requested an analysis of what other cities do, most other large cities. Um, spend the bulk of their budget on grants to arts organizations, not to run facilities. And so I have felt that it is really important to keep both elements um, alive and thriving in our department, and that if you um, focus too much on one, it's going to really um, hurt the, the other um, area. And so um, in explaining it to Mr. Zine, he, um, and Mr. Rosendahl as well, um, they both thought that, you know, having a, a more balanced approach between the grants that we give to private non-for-profits and the money that we dedicate to the art facilities um, that we manage um, really needed to stay in a balanced kind of relationship. And, and that's essentially what that was all about. Okay. Uh, on that issue there, what do the other cities do? Are some, some cities... Some cities don't have any facilities and some... I know. I want to report on it. Okay. Because uh, I, I'm half and half on that. If there's facilities, if there's houses, if I could call a building a house, and a house is a home for art, but if there's more opportunity for artists, there's a question, you know, what, what do you support? Do you support a house that's empty or do you try to get them first? So again, with the top ten cities and then the coastal cities that would be good we do have some public comment cards on this item sure uh, this does have uh, Ziva is Ziva here 
That's your first name? An international is your last name? That is correct. You can't yeah. pronounce my real last name, so Ziva International. All right, that's okay. I want you to, like, there's a Laker who just changed his name, too, so. But anyway, we got Ziva you today. Ziva International has been it for at least 12 years now, so. As your official last name. That is correct. Very good. Thank that you, Ziva. Correct. Good morning, please. Good morning, sir. And I'm here to discuss the fact that grant money should go not to the bureaucracies, not to all of these interminable reports. And I have to say, as someone who has been here in L.A. for many, many years, I'm appalled at all of the directions that you are having to give that are wasting money that could, would, and should go to arts education. I'm here representing the Barnstall Alliance, but I have also represented many downtown arts organizations. I am committed to the arts in this city as well as globally. And the fact is that we need money to go to actual arts programs. We need grant money that is going to the arts, not to go to the bureaucracy of the arts, but actually teaching the arts to old people, young people, disabled people, regular people, because the arts are necessary for health and wellness. The arts are necessary for mathematics education, science education. Every single country that has higher science and mathematics scores than we do utilize the arts. The reason why I, as a brain-injured person, am sitting before you today seeing after spending five and a half years blind is because I had that extra arts education as a child in music and dance that helped me to develop the 20% more of my brain that people who have early arts education have developed. I was able to utilize that 20% extra brain wiring to heal brain injuries, to get over disabilities, and to work with disabilities that I have. Now, you're putting all of this money into, let's do more studies. No, let's put the money into teaching the kids. That's what we need to do. Let's put it right to the artists, right to the people, right to the facilities that the city has to teach art. Thank you. Can I ask you a question? Yes. You believe in doctors? Do I believe in doctors? Yeah. My father was the director of the Institute of Pathology and Downstate Medical. My grandfather was the doctor that helped the King of Serbia develop a series of mountain clinics. I believe some in doctors. I okay, believe so basically in international what we have to do, doctors. I got it. But we have to do an assessment on all these things and then make the correct steps. And I appreciate what you're saying. I'd rather see if I could call it more money on the street than in the city hall because the city hall is a building, and, but the street is where the people are. So I appreciate that, but I think as to answer you, because you listened to this meeting today, all those departments need to make an assessment as they go forward because we're dealing with the public's money. And if Tom, we just- there's a heck of a lot of assessing going on and not a heck of a lot coming to the people. I say we need them both. I say bring them closer to the people because those assessing are making fat bucks and eating well, and those are the people who want to come to Barnstall Art Park and take classes and learn arts and experience the arts are not getting it, okay? Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good day. Now, who's representing BACSAC? You gotta put your first name on it now. And your last name, but that's all right, we got it. For the record. Okay, how you doing? <clears throat> how you doing, Tom? Good. Um, I just want to reiterate. For the record, you got to say your name. Uh, Randy Kiefer. Yeah. Um, and I just want to reiterate and support what you're saying about uh, the situation in terms of the arts and supporting um, community art centers and 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 sharing the grants. Um, possibly 50% of that fund, you know, for the community art centers. Um, why? Because I think it serves, it's the greatest amount of numbers that serves, you know, 
as the mission statement says on the DCA uh, web page for Los Angeles, um, the goal is to enhance the quality of life of 4 million residents in LA, 25 million annual visitors, stated by Antonio. Um, below that, it states our challenges. We we accomplished this goal by generating and supporting high quality arts and cultural experiences. We ensure access to that, those experiences through the grant, make, grant um, making process said by Olga. So I'm just trying to get back to basics here in terms of uh, what our real mission is and uh, serving the greater Los Angeles and its visitors which is, a, to me, it's a, uh, that's the highest visibility and uh, support that we can give to L.A., uh, the numbers, the highest numbers, Right. if you want to uh, serve L.A. So I support. Thank you for your support. Thank you, Randy. Right. San Francisco came down this weekend, and they brought one of their trolleys. It only goes 40 miles an hour. It's like a cable car with wheels on it. And they went around to various cultural sites, and they have a thing called 49 Hours. San Francisco is 7 by 7 miles, 49 square miles, and the 49ers and all sorts of other connections to the 49ers. And it all was about arts and how you deal with and enjoy the arts. And the same could be true for our community. The same could be true for San Diego, Portland and other cities on the coast to promote the arts and as Ms. Garai will tell you who's been a champion uh, for uh, what they call cultural tourism it's a key but at the same hand the community center that somebody who's never been to a city hall is going to go to their community center art program today and have a fulfilling experience is very key to promote and have open to I know the Royals enjoyed it Mm -hmm. when they came here so they were good people just like you <laughs> his hair wasn't as long as yours randy but he uh he's and he's almost as tall as you though oh, okay. well, that's, that's was a good, good. thing yeah it's a good thing and they walked and greeted the people spontaneously mm -hmm. so. but anyway okay. thank you so much all right i have no other cards here does anyone have any other comments so with not at uh, 9.35 on this date, this meeting is adjourned. Yes. We have item 13. 13? I didn't see 13. Let me have 13. That's why we have a great city clerk, Richard. <laughs> 13, please. Yeah, 12 is being continued yeah. for more research. Uh, 90 days? Mm -hmm. Yes. Item number 13 is an adopted budget recommendation relative to a report from the city administrative officer, chief legislative analyst, and the community development department with a four-year plan to keep the Vera Davis Community Center operational while the Proposition K analysis and or improvements are complete. Good morning, Saul Romo for the Department of Cultural Affairs. Uh, this. This item comes from a recommendation to transfer authority for operational and management authority for the Vera Davis Community Center from the Department of Community Development to the Department of Cultural Affairs. Um, we've had extensive discussions among um, some of the city agencies, um, meetings between the Community Development Department, representatives of the um, Office of the City Attorney, the CAO, um, Council District 11, as well as the Department of Cultural Affairs. And since this motion to, was originally um, submitted proposing the transfer, we've come to the conclusion that it's in the best interest to maintain operational management um, of the facility with CDD. Not with you? Not, with, not in the interim. Um, the, at some point, there are, prop, there are improvements that have to be made to the facility to fulfill the city's obligations to Is Mr. Rosendahl's office made an opinion on this? Correct. Have they made an opinion? Uh, well, they have been involved in the discussions, and they and my understanding is that the, that the offices um, they concur with our assessment. There is a representative here from CD11. If you'd like some further yes, comment, deputy from CD11 here, would you like to make a comment on behalf of Mr. Rosendahl?
Hi, good morning. Arthur Pina, Office of Council Member Bill Rosendahl. Yes, we have worked and continue to work hand in hand with both cultural affairs and CDD as we work through some of the challenges of keeping the Vera Davis Center open. And so what do you want to, what's the council want to do? Uh, well, we want to continue with the assessment because this building is under Prop K and uh, we're working with Bureau of Engineering as they move forward with their reports to clarify what improvements need to be done. To Very good. And uh, how much time do you need? For the full Prop K assessment to be done, I, we expect that that's going to be at least like a four to five year project before it's ready to be turned over to, CD, to DCA. Four to five years? That sounds like you're going up you know, well, state. Well, that's, that's true. Um, in many no, respects, make an assessment. I'm going to have this no, 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 no. committee well, in 90 days, and you're going to tell me what your plan is, not a four or five year. You're going to tell me what it's going to take. Okay? Well, we can report back with you on what the long-term plan is for the facility. We've a written report on what it's going to take and the value of it. And with CDD? It's, uh, CDD is currently managing the facility. For the record, state your name. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Carolyn Weiss, Community right. Development Department. Yes. Um, we are, we have been running the facility for about 10 years. We will continue to run it uh, using um, general fund money um, combined with some monies from the uh, Summer Youth Employment Program. I know. So that's, uh, for this next, this current fiscal year, it's $80,000. Which is enough to to maintain staffing. But to make an assessment, like in 90 days, could this committee have a clearer picture from the council office, from CDD, from cultural affairs? Not like a four or five year process. That's either. What's the plan? Is that good? That's good. Okay, so we'll continue this 90 days. Thank you, Miss Weiss. Nice to see you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. No other business, no other 14, number 14. You know what number 14 is, city attorney? Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.